and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Norberto Sirocco is a Pentecostal pastor and scholar and founder of the International Faculty of Theological Studies. In the midst of the fear and repression and death that accompanied the Argentinian coup of 1976, including the death of close to 30,000 people, Norberto Sirocco helped steer the Argentinian church towards unity and healing and mission. He was instrumental in shaping theological education and pastoral training in Argentina in a time when they're under great stress and great pressure, both militarily and politically. From 76 pastors taking courses over the weekend in 1978, he averaged 1,800 students every year by the time he finished. Alberto Saraco, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you. You're pastoring a large church in Buenos Aires. You're also the president of the Theological College yeah. and have been involved in Lausanne for a long time. Mm. Can you tell me something about how you got into ministry, these kinds of ministries? Okay, I'm 67 years old and I started my pastoral ministry 43 years again, mm. uh, ago. And I come from a Pentecostal background. One of the things is that my first time that I preached was when I was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and for that time... <laughs> 12. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time ago. Well, yeah. my first call was a pastorate. Yeah. And because that, I went to the seminary in Central America, Costa Rica from 72 to 77. In that opportunity, mm. the, my church here in Argentina asked me mm. that when I finish the studies, uh, they want to start, my, when I finish my studies, they want to start a seminary here in Argentina. And they proposed to me that when I'm back here, I start a seminary. Mm. And I did that, I did that. That means that from that time, to be a pastor and at the same time, to be the principal and the founder mm. of the seminary, were the two things, the two main ministries of my life. Our seminary now has uh, 6,800 students. Mm. It's a very large seminary, mm. all with Spanish-speaking students. Mm -hmm. And we have a student here in Argentina and in many countries in Latin America, including Spanish-speaking mm -hmm. people in North America and other mm -hmm. countries also. And my relation with Lausanne in one way began many years ago, I, I don't remember when, because we work with the Lausanne Covenant, mm -hmm. I am a member of the Latin America uh, fraternity of theology, and we were close with the Lausanne, mm -hmm. but officially it was in 19, no, sorry, 2004, 2004, mm -hmm. in a meeting of Lausanne, uh, I don't remember where, I, uh, I suppose it was in Thailand, no. mm. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I don't remember when. But in that year, 2004, when the Lausanne decide to, I don't know, I say to relaunch <laughs> Lausanne or something like that, and they chose a new direction of Lausanne, and new people, they invite me to be the international deputy director for Latin America. And then from 2004 up to 2011, mm. I was in Lausanne as an IDD. Mm. You've been heavily involved in leading Catholic evangelical conversations. Yeah. And since 2001, those conversations have increased in 15 years. Can you tell me something about the Catholic evangelical conversations in Argentina and Latin America? Well, uh, I don't know from where to start. Mm. Uh, my first relation uh, with Catholics was in 73, 
when I was in Costa Rica, Central America, in that time with the charismatic Catholics. I participated in many meetings with them and we did some things uh, together, mm. uh, but only with charismatic uh, Catholics. In that time also, I'm talking mm. about the beginning of the 70s, and because the charismatic movement mm. in the evangelical Protestant church and at the same time the charismatic movement, movement in the Catholic church, mm. in that time there were some kind of uh, there was some kind of relations with the Catholics and evangelical charismatic evangelicals, okay. But in the eighties and nineties, for for different reasons, for different reasons, especially from reasons from the Catholic uh, Church, because the Catholic hierarchy was not very happy with that kind of things. They try to stop uh, the charismatic movement in Latin mm -hmm. America, and, uh, and at the same time that kind of relation. Um, and that was true in the last years, in the last mm -hmm. decades. But this new relation that we start here in 2001, 2002, was because uh, like people, like Catholic people, Matteo Calisi, uh, he came from Italy to here Argentina to have some kind of contact with uh, Catholics, Charismatics. Mm. But at the same time, he knew some uh, pastor in Italy. Uh, through him, also some pastor Jorge Mitian here in, in Argentina. Jorge Mitian was one of the leaders of the Charismatic mm. movement in the 60s and 70s. And when Matteo came to Argentina, he tried to have some kind of contact uh, with uh, Jorge Mitian mm. and the possibility to see other charismatic Pentecostal pastor. And when he came, we had an informal, non formal meeting, just was a lunch in a Catholic place. And from in that lunch participated some uh, members of the charismatic Catholic mm -hmm. uh, community here mm -hmm. in Argentina. I'm talking about seven, eight, ten people, no more than. Mm -hmm. But that was important because it was the beginning mm -hmm. of a new relation. Then we decide to see us again, to have another meeting, just to know one another. And we realized that we have many things in common, at least our spirituality mm. and our true understanding of our Lord and our deeper desire from the unity of the chair. And we talk mm. about the unity, I'm not thinking, and we are not we were not thinking in a structural unity. Mm. Okay. But about the necessity to consider one another as a brother and sister in Christ, mm. um, talk together about the possibility to do some things. Mm. That was a very, very non formal conversation. But uh, during that time, we realized that we have many things in mm. common, at least our vision, our expectations. Mm. And then we decide to have a meeting, a public meeting, mm. as a testimony mm. between Catholics and Evangelical. Mm. And we did that, if I will remember, it was in 2003. Mm. It was in the auditorium of the Catholic University here in Buenos Aires. And 1,000 people participated in that mm. event. We were very enthusiastic about that mm. and, and about the result of that. And then we decided to have a second meeting, a public mm. meeting. And we did uh, one year later in uh, evangelical church mm. 
And in that opportunity, opportunity there were about uh, 1,800 people. And were they mostly church leaders? Yes, uh, church leaders and uh, just a member of the church. Members too. Uh, yes. yes, and leaders from the charismatic movement. At the beginning was from the charismatic movement yes. of the Catholic Church. Mm. And most of charismatic from the evangelical side, but mm. from the beginning participated the pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Buenos Aires. Mm. And pastors of other very important local churches here in Buenos Aires that they are mm. not the Pentecostal or Charismatics. Mm. Okay, we we had that we had that second meeting. Then mm. we decided to have a more important meeting. Mm. Um, we planned that uh, we decided to have that meeting in 2006 mm. in a large uh, stadium here in Buenos Aires called Luna Park. Mm. Uh, with, uh, it's an indoor stadium with capacity for 7,500 mm. people. Mm. And then we uh, began to prepare that. For that kind of event, for, of that magnitude of event, the Catholic people, of course, need the authorization or at least the goodwill mm. of the bishops and authorities. Mm. And they went, because they had a very good relation, they, will, they went to talk with the Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, mm. who today is the Pope. Yes. And he was very open mm. and he supported from the beginning mm. this kind of event. Mm. Then we did it and for that we invite from the Catholic side Father Reiniero Cantalamesa, mm. uh, who is, uh, he is a very, very important preacher in the Catholic Church. Uh, he preached to the Curia in the Vatican. Mm. Um, he's charismatic also. Mm. And he has in that role for many, many years, maybe from the 70s or mm. 80s. And we invite him to be one of the preachers for the Catholic mm. side. From the evangelical Protestant side, mm. we invite uh, Marcos Witt. He is a well-known singer, and mm. very famous all over Latin America, and the evangelicals and charismatic people mm. uh, were very happy to invite him uh, because uh, nobody had problem with him, with his ministry, mm. and he was also well-known for the Catholic people mm. because mm. he sounds. Um, we did that meeting, it was a fabulous meeting, from 9 in the morning up to 6, 7 in the afternoon, during the other day. Mm. Yeah, in, and the Cardinal, the Gold, was during all that meeting, mm. just sitting with the people. Um, in the afternoon, we invite him just to say something to the audience. Mm. because uh, he didn't want to do that. Mm. He wanted just to remain sitting with the people mm. in the auditorium. But he was the cardinal. And we said, please just come to the platform and say something mm. to the people here. And he came to the platform and said some words. And because the importance of that meeting, uh, many people from the media who was there, the journalists of the main newspapers and the main uh, television channels and radio mm. stations were there because the, the magnitude and the importance of that meeting. Mm. They know all of them were when the cardinal uh, was on the platform and mm. he 
gave greeting to the audience. Mm. At the final of his greeting to the audience, he said, as he said today, he said, please uh, pray for me. Mm. Just as a greeting, no more than. Mm. Finish and said, okay, pray for me. When he said that, uh, we in the platform said, okay, just uh, let's go pray. Mm. And then we went to the front and uh, we began to pray for him. And we did that in our style, just mm. to put our hands yeah. <laughs> over his head. <laughs> Uh, we think it today that, that was amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you didn't didn't know at the time. Yeah, he, he, he was he was a cardinal at the time. <laughs> but he was a cardinal, <laughs> <laughs> and the pastor just prayed for him with the, our hands over his yeah. head, <laughs> and that moment was shocked. Mm. for the audience, mm. for the media, for us, and for the Cardinal also. Mm. We believe that something happened there in mm. that moment. Mm. It was very interesting that uh, two years ago, when uh, the Cardinal was elected Pope, mm. There were a lot of uh, books and people talking about that. And one journalist, no believer, he doesn't believe in any church, he wrote many things about the new Pope. And he wrote about that event. Mm. Mm. And he said, he's not a believer, he said that that event, produce some change yeah. in his life. He used that the words, mm. some change. Well, we know that something happened there. Mm. It was very interesting that the journalists uh, take pictures about that moment, mm. and the next day, uh, that picture with the Cardinal and Pastor praying for him mm. uh, was published in the front page of every mm. newspaper here in Argentina. Mm. Uh, okay, from, from that moment our relation was growing and growing and we mm. did a lot of things together. But that is the beginning of, that, uh, mm. of this history. It's very interesting to think about the influence of Catholic, uh, evangelical, and charismatic ecumenical mm. relations yeah. on, the, on the current Pope, and also the presence of charismatic traditions in all of that. So when you tell the story, I hear that the charismatics had a, a lot of influence on charismatic Catholics, yeah. charismatic Protestants, yeah. had a lot of influence on people coming together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then even... True praying over, over the current Pope yeah. at that time when he was the Cardinal. Yes. Uh, uh, the question is, or would be, uh, why? Yeah. <laughs> why for charismatics is uh, easier uh, to yeah. do that? And what role uh, does the Holy Spirit play in this? Yes. Mm. You give me the answer. Mm. You remember at the beginning of the church, in the book of Acts, mm. when new kind of believers come, mm. mm. and the church who was born in a Jewish background mm. had to accept them. One of the criteria was they had received the Holy Spirit. Mm. As us. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that means you remember the mission that Peter uh, had about different uh, animals mm. coming from heaven. 
and as he has to accept them just because the Lord has accepted them before. Mm. Um, during the centuries and up to today, that criteria remained uh, uh, with valid. Uh, and today is, is the same. Yeah. When we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the other believers, yeah. then we say, okay, we realize that we are different. We have different backgrounds, different histories, uh, different theology. We have a yeah. lot of difference. But the Lord of the Church is doing with you the same that he's doing with me then at least I have to accept the Lord. Mm. And that is a very, very strong uh, issue in the ecumenical relations. This is a very strong starting point in the mm. ecumenical relation because I see you then as my brother. Mm. And I know that we are different. I know that we have a different theology and we have many reasons in our history to be separated. But at the same time, if the head of the church has accepted you in the same way that he's accepted me, and we can see that because you receive the Holy Spirit that me, mm. then I have to accept you. And I started from that, mm. we can build a new kind of relation based in what the Lord is doing in your life and in my life. Mm. That is because this kind of relation, mm. what I call a new ecumenism, if you want, this kind of relation began in a personal relation. Mm. And that is the difference. And if you see, the Pope in the last two years, he put in the first place the personal relation. Mm. This doesn't mean that he doesn't take in account the structures, mm. and the history and all that kind of things. But what he said, I know his voice, but know something about him. Mm. But the, the, what he said is that we are brothers in Christ, and that is more important than our difference. Mm. It's true that we have difference, but it's more important that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm. Then we have to begin, begin in this truth that we are brothers and sisters, and from that, we had to try to resolve mm. our difference. Mm. The traditional ecumenism, that is very important and was very important also, the starting point was our difference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the starting point was <laughs> our structures. Yes. Yeah? And then we tried to resolve our difference. Mm. And as I said in some occasion, this kind of ecumenism has arrived to a limit. Yes. Why? Because no, because now I know you, mm. I know that we are different, mm. I know that we have historical and theological reasons to be different, mm. and because I know you, I'm ready to respect you, to love you, and I suppose the same from you with me. And stop. Yeah. Now, today, we know more one another. Mm. But, can continue that. Mm. But, if you start from another side, mm. if you start, if you start from the personal side. If you say you are my brothers and sister, and we have to work together. Mm. Because if you are my brother 
son sista. That means that we belong to the same church. Otherwise, impossible to be brother and sister. Mm. We belong to the same church. Mm. Of course, we don't understand many of the difference. Mm. The difference are there. We try to resolve that. The difference have a lot of justification, of course, historical, theological, whatever. Mm. But if we continue in that way, it's impossible to advance. Mm. And that is the crisis of the ecumenical traditional movement. Mm. It was very important. It's very important. Mm. And I think it's necessary to continue in dialogue with the other confessions. We have to continue working at that, that, that level, trying mm. to resolve our difference. But at the same time, mm. what is more and more important is the ecumenism through our relation, mm. to accept one another, and to work together. Mm. Because the, the, the issue is the mission. Mm. Just don't the good relation yeah. <laughs> with the neighbor. Yeah. Okay? It's the, the, the main issue is, mm. is, is the mission. It looks to me that something unique has happened in Latin America, where Catholics and Evangelicals and Pentecostals, Charismatics are starting to come together. And it'll be interesting to see how that begins to spread out into other parts of the world. So you, you've been leading discussions at Lausanne mm -hmm. on Catholic Evangelical conversations. What changes are you seeing happen in Catholic Evangelical relationships well, to be honest, including in Latin America, we are just at the beginning yeah. of this moment. To be honest, I have to say that we are a very, very small minority. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the situation in each country is, is different. Mm. It's true that here in Argentina, including Brazil, in some areas in Brazil, the, the, here we are more open to this relation. It's true that you can find in different countries in Latin America, people pastors, leaders, bishops, Catholic bishops, open to this relation. Mm -hmm. There are many people working in the same mm -hmm. direction. But if you put this in numbers, mm -hmm. uh, we are a, a mm -hmm. minority. But, to be honest also, uh, you cannot ignore uh, that for instance, the people who are participating in this, at least here in Argentina, the pastors are members of the Council of Pastors here in Argentina. Uh, one is the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. The other is the leader of the largest evangelical and Protestant churches mm -hmm. here in Argentina. What I try to say is they represents something in the body of Christ mm. here yeah. and the same for the Catholic side. Yeah. I, I try to, to be clear, this yes. is a movement of God, I believe that. Day after day, more people is involved in that, is open. I just mm. came from Brazil yesterday mm -hmm. and <laughs> I saw there uh, a new movement mm. in this direction uh, it just started okay mm. you mentioned the dialogue uh, from Lausanne and Catholic it's the same it's, it's just started something it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, and, and we did that we started that through Lausanne uh, just because we considered that Lausanne is a good platform to do that mm. uh, 
is not the same that the World Evangelical Alliance because the World Evangelical Alliance represents denominations, churches, national alliances. Yeah. And I know that they are very open, but at the same time, we know that it's not easy to advance when you have yeah. such kind of structure. Okay, yes. we, we consider that. Mm. But in the case of Lausanne, it's not an official dialogue with the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, but for the in the taking account what the Lausanne is, that we are members, uh, mm. churches, people that are mm. members in that vision, then it's easy to have this mm. kind of conversation, not in an official way, but at the same time do it mm. and try to open uh, mm. new doors in this relation. Mm. Then, once again, what I try to say is just the beginning. Yes. It's just the beginning. Mm. Um, and, but, of course, as you know, and the people know, uh, the role of this Pope is, is very important. Mm. Okay? Because the power of the Catholic Church, um, because the gestures, the attitudes of the Pope mm. uh, with the evangelical apostate, mm. that I want to say that he is very honest with that. Mm because I have heard in different contexts question about the honesty of this uh, openness of the Pope, okay? Mm. Uh, what are behind that? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, and maybe nothing, you've, you've told nothing, us... Nothing, nothing. <laughs> well, you've told us some of the story that is the background to his openness to other, yeah. other groups. And uh, we continue to pray that um, that openness continues yeah. as a work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In 2012, you gave a talk to Lausanne yeah. on the nature of effective partnerships. Yeah. What do you think are the key features of effective partnerships today? Well, if I will remember, uh, that paper was about theological education. Theological education. Yeah. And in that context, uh, I was talking about the necessity to a new kind of relations and, uh, within the theological institutions around the world. Yeah. I was uh, thinking in, in that. And one of the areas that you've just uh, mentioned as well is mm. that one of the keys to effective partnerships is, is deep relationship. Yes. A true relationship. Yes. Uh, mm. As I say once again, it was in the context of theological education. Mm. And talking from that context, mm. as a principal of seminary here in Latin mm. America, we, the seminary here in Latin America, we need to think mm. about how, how we can have a better relation. Mm. When I say a better relation, I'm talking just a good relation of friends. Mm talking about uh, a structural relation. Mm. Because otherwise, the theological education, at least here in Latin America, doesn't have a future. Mm. Most of the seminaries are in very, very serious crisis, economical crisis, and also vision mm. and mission crisis. Uh, the, the theological seminary were planted here in Latin America as a project from the different missions, denominational mm. missions. Mm -hmm. But today the reality mm. is totally different. And the seminary cannot survive in the way that they are doing things today. Just four or five days ago, the main seminary here in Argentina, which has the main library of Latin America with almost 200,000 books, has closed. Mm -hmm. and that was the ecumenical seminary incident. Uh, seven churches are there, Presbyterian, Episcopal, mm -hmm. uh, Anglican Church, uh, two different Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, uh, Disciple of Christ, uh, Valdez and churches. Um, 
seminary when, with 131 years of history. Mm -hmm. Was it a financial issue or what, what caused it? Well, to different kind of crisis mm -hmm. working together, not only financial. Mm -hmm. What I say is when you have a crisis of vision, you know, when you have a crisis of mission, mm. the financial crisis is a consequence. <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> uh, but, okay, uh, sometimes we put our eyes on oh, yes. finances, but it is a consequence. What I, what I try to say is that the theological education, at least in our continent, Latin America, is in a very serious crisis. And we need to develop new relations, not only for survival, new relations that imply to think together the, how would be the mission of the theological education, theological seminaries mm -hmm. here in Latin America today. We cannot repeat the seminaries in the United States or mm -hmm. Europe. We cannot repeat that. Mm -hmm. if we we need to be together. That means that we, as a seminary, we cannot offer all kinds of courses that we offer today. Mm. We cannot have the faculty that each seminary has today. Mm. We need to work together in this, mm. in this issue. But what I try to say is that opportunity is that to be open yeah. to the reality. As you can see, Mm. I love the relation. I love the mm. unity of the church. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll ask you a question about the Latin American church in general. Now, there's the church in West in the Western culture is in decline. You know, so we talk about the United States, for instance. The church is in real trouble. Yeah. And up until recently, Latin American church has been growing quickly. But I think that might might have plateaued or stopped. Yeah. And I wonder whether you see the churches of Latin America face a similar crisis of vision and mission today that you mentioned in theological education. I mentioned theological education. Is that a, do you think that that is a problem more broadly for the Latin American church, a crisis of vision and mission today? Well, uh... I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's just exactly the same. You mm. are right that the church here in Latin America has grown in the last two or three decades. Mm. Uh, from, yes, from the 80s. And you are right also that today there is a platform in the mm. growing in the church. That, 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 that is true. That is true. But I think that today the main problem that the Latin American church has is that for many years we have think in church growth mm -hmm. with the categories of church growth and the church grow. Mm. But the problem is that the kingdom of God didn't grow ah. in the same yeah. level. Then, for me, that means that we have a lot of evangelicals, hmm. but this enormous amount of evangelical doesn't affect the society. I'm not talking only in political issues. I'm talking about just the human issues, relations, family, mm. the right of divorce mm. in the society is the same that in the church. Mm. Mm. You have um, uh, countries like in Central America, mm. Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, where more than 40, mm. almost 50 percent of the population are evangelicals. And at the same time, you have the violence in there. They are the more poorest country in Latin America. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you have violence, you have a lot of crisis there. Mm. And when you see that crisis in family, in society, mm. then you can understand how it's possible that half percent of the population are believers in Christ, uh, and at the same time you have mm. that kind of reality. Mm. Then the problem that we see today and that is the problem for the future and the near future because the new generations see all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. The problem is that oh, it's true the church has war, but not at the same level the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And the issue for me is that the call of the church is not to grow. call of the church is to be faithful. Mm. According to the Bible, my interpretation is that the kingdom of God has to grow. Mm. To kingdom can. Your kingdom can. Mm. Your, will, your will be done here as a head. Mm. That is the kingdom of God. And we need that that kind of things grow. Mm. The kingdom of God is justice. The kingdom of God is love. Hmm. We need that kind of things. Hmm. But if we think in church grow, it's a big, big, big mistake. Yes. Because the church is not called to grow. The church is called to be faithful. Hmm. And if the church is faithful, the kingdom of God hmm. will grow. Yes. It's just my interpretation. But I think that this is the crisis. Yeah. If we want to use that word crisis, this mm. is the situation, the reality of the church today. That's helpful. Of course, many mm. pastors are not aware of that. They continue to be very happy with numbers. But if you study that numbers, and if you study the reality of the church, and you study what is happening in the society today, and in the families mm. also, then you will have a very, very serious mm. concern. Mm. Yeah. And where do you see signs of hope? Where do you see the church in Latin America being the people of God, advancing the kingdom of God? Just any signs or stories of hope that you see? Yes, at the, time, at the same time, yes, we see signs of hope. Because in, in some contexts, uh, you can find pastors that uh, talking about these issues. Mm. And you can find here and there conversations, small meetings of leaders talking about these issues. And I think that the Evangelical Protestant Church uh, in Latin America, the Evangelical Church, uh, has up to today a dynamic, a strong mm. a call. Um, I think that it's possible, of course, to change things. Mm. Uh, it's, it's possible to do that. My, my hope is to see a pastor talking about this issue. Of course, not the majority mm. of the pastor. Okay? Mm. But you can find concern here and there. What's happening with this? Mm. We have the church, but we have this kind of problem. Mm. Then something has to affect our message. Something has to affect mm. the way that we do the things. Mm. Because if we do the things in this way, and we get mm. these results. <laughs> we have seen the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And my, my hope, and the hope that I see, is just to see people in the church. I'm talking about leaders begin to talking about this issue and to think about this. Hmm. If you were to summarize your vision for the church of Latin America, what would you, how would you talk about it? What would the church in Latin America look like um, if it was more 
continuing to be faithful to the kingdom of God and the mission of God today? I think in the category of mission, um, I think that the strong church, first, our, our society would be totally different. Mm. We have here in Latin America a very, 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 very important amount of corruption. Corruption is the main problem that we have in Latin America because mm. poverty and other things are the consequence of corruption. Yes. Of course, I know that you can find corruption everywhere. Mm. Okay, but the dimension of the corruption here in Latin America and the acceptance of that corruption for all the people, <laughs> okay, is the main problem. And I would like to see the church really affecting the life in that way that we can stop such measure of corruption. Mm. I would like to see the church working that way. Mm. Um, when I talk about hope and pastors uh, talking about these issues, my, my hope is because we, we, we are aware that something is happening with the churches that is not affected the life. And once again, I'm talking just affecting the society, which is a very important, you know, or at a political level, which is a very important also. But I'm talking just about affecting the, the, the daily life yeah. of the common people. Yeah. And the church has to do that. Yeah. And my hope in this is that the church in Latin America can do mm. something in this in this issue the main mission will be that mm. and of course you, we can talk about the christian latin america as a task force for mission everywhere mm. and that is true today you can find missionaries from latin america everywhere uh, you can find many churches aware with the missionary mm. issues uh, trying to send missionaries mm. here and there that, that, that is a, a good sign, of course, uh, but I think that the, the, the main challenge that the Latin American church has today mm. is within Latin America, mm. with our people and with mm. the church and the state of the church today. Mm. But of course, we, we, have, we have hope, mm. because we can see signs of hope here and there. Norberto Soreco, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Oh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. I yeah. appreciate that. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.